Lately on the channel, I have been doing some Disney stuff. I've got some Tiki on my mind. And for me, those two things kind of go hand in hand. And I want to talk about that. But first, I've got to have a drink in my hand. Wouldn't you know it? But I've got this handy little uh, zombie mug I got from Trader Sam's. And, and wouldn't a zombie be just great in that? Wouldn't that be just fantastic? Mm. I'm gonna make a zombie as close to the original 1934 version invented by Don Beach as I possibly can. And then I'm gonna tell you a story about Disney, me, and Tiki, and my grandparents. Let's start with three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. Three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. Half an ounce of falernum. John D. Taylor's Velvet Falernum. One half an ounce. It's like a rum-based liqueur. Now we're getting into the part of this drink where you find out why Don Beach was famous for only allowing you to order two. And honestly, I think letting someone order two is a bit insane. We're gonna need an ounce and a half of a light rum. This cork just fell apart. That's fun. We're gonna have an ounce and a half of rum. This is Probitas. It's probably my favorite rum for daiquiris right now. I think it sells in other countries under the name Veritas. We need an ounce and a half of a Jamaican rum, something with some funk. And you want an ounce and a half of a 151 overproof Demerara style rum. You can get that from Lemonheart or from Hamilton. And maybe, I don't know, there's probably somebody else. Oh, and not an ounce and a half. You want one ounce of this, one ounce. Jesus Christ, I'm trying to kill someone here. A teaspoon of grenadine, officially, I don't know what a teaspoon is, like a quarter of an ounce or something slightly more than covering the bottom of my jigger. That feels about right. That's about a teaspoon. Six drops of absinthe, or I think one spritz of an atomizer of absinthe will do the trick too. There you go. One dash of Angostura bitters, and half an ounce of something called Don's Mix, which is a combination of simple syrup, grapefruit juice, and cinnamon. One half an ounce of this. Uh, I'll put the recipe for Don's Mix in the somewhere. A little crushed ice from my handy ice crusher. and I'm gonna pour it into there. What a photogenic mug that is. I love this sucker. Throw a little mint in there, and uh, off to zombie town. That is what I needed. Oh, Lord. <laughs> it's a glass of vacation. Oh my God, that's dangerously good. The thing about these early tiki drinks that a lot of people may not realize is that like, they liked rum. They liked things that tasted like rum. They didn't want to hide the rum. They wanted to do a big, bold set of flavors around it that lifted it up, and that's what you got here. And oh, what a thing this is. I mean, it's got some heat. It's got some funk and hogo. There's of course the little notes of grapefruit, not very loud. The cinnamon is quite present in my particular mix here. I find like there's a beat there of toasted marshmallows without being a toasted marshmallow drink. It doesn't taste like a s'more. It's just a dangerous good time. The dangerous good time, unless you hate rum, in which case you might want something that's a lot sweeter and less spirit forward. I do want to stop here though and let you know that this episode is brought to you by you, the patrons on my Patreon. Thank you so much for your continued support of the show. I really hope that I am giving you everything that you signed up for. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And for the rest of you, if you love this show, if you want me to keep making this show, and if you want me to be able to say no to sponsors from time to time, please take a look at my Patreon. You know, over there, you're gonna find episodes of How to Drink Without Commercials. You're gonna find exclusive behind the scenes things, updates about what's going on here. There is uh, outtakes from some episodes, sometimes things that don't make the cut. Like this episode very likely will have a whole episode of outtakes. Uh, there's a private Discord server, which has an amazing community, just great people all having a very nice time, hanging out and talking about everything, including cocktails, but just whatever. I'm in there usually uh, asking for advice about what episodes I should be making and sharing insights about what it's like to work on something like this and make a living at it. So if you love the show and you would like to do something to make it possible to continue, take a look at my Patreon and see if i am got anything over there that's of interest to you. And thank you for those of you who are patrons of the show. Thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart. Hubba dubba, hubba dubba. I think that might be my new tiki toast, hubba dubba. So let me paint you a picture. I think it's 1988, 1989. I'm eight years old. That's the main thing. I'm eight years old. It's summer. I'm outside on the front lawn or maybe I was on the porch. I'm outside because I vividly recall watching my grandparents pull up in their motorhome. And my grandmother opened up the window and said, hey, who wants to go to Florida? And I asked, hey, can we go to Disney World? 
And they looked at each other and they kind of shrugged and said, sure, why not? So I went and I packed the bag because who the hell would say no to that? Um, maybe you though. There are probably some things about my grandparents in this motorhome that I should clarify so that you understand what it was that I was agreeing to. So here's who my grandparents are. My grandmother's a burlesque dancer. She used to perform under the name of Frenchie Ferre. And yes, for those of you who are wondering, I have seen some wildly inappropriate photographs of my grandmother. <laughs> My grandfather was a linguist. He had a doctorate in linguistics. Uh, actually, while he was doing his dissertation at Yale, apparently on his GI grant, he was roomed in a Quonset hut. He was roommates with Noam Chomsky. My grandfather went on to do some work for, I think the CIA, but certainly the NSA. You know, he was pretty cagey, but he didn't tell, <laughs> obviously. They were hoarders. My grandparents were hoarders. Uh, back then in 88 or 89, maybe somebody had the word hoarder, but I mean, we didn't know that word. I just thought, eh, their house is very dirty. And it was just like this motorhome I was climbing into. There were papers everywhere in the house, everywhere. There was broken typewriters. There was dead plants. There was, uh, my grandfather had a, a study that had like kind of fallen in on itself. There were filing cabinets toppled over. I remember he had like a bust of Beethoven. Dudes used to have busts. What's that about? It was as bad a hoarding situation as you can possibly imagine. There was a sticky film on every surface. I think it was from like uh, high temperature frying. The frying oil in the kitchen would just flash vaporize and then somewhere else in the house redeposit and it would mix with dust and animal dander and frankly cockroach poop and become like a cement that kind of covered everything. They had three dogs who were huge, ungroomed, untrained Old English sheepdogs. Have you ever seen this dog? You know, it's got like this mop of fur usually in front of its eyes. I suppose you could trim it off, but for some reason people always leave it there. It's supposed to look like that, Greg, I would be told whenever I said they can't see. That's the style, Greg. That's what they look like, Gregory. And you know, like the whole house stunk of, the dogs went to the bathroom wherever they want, so stunk like that. There was a closet, a closet full of like moldering old fur coats and just, you know? But they did have cable, which we did not have. And they did have the Disney Channel, which we certainly didn't have. And my parents would leave me there for a weekend. My parents looked around that, they said, that's fine. You can have Greg for the weekend. And when I stayed there, she would keep me up like way past one in the morning because she needed me to watch USA Up all night with her. I am Ron Hashir, host of USA Up all night. And I'm Gilbert Gottfried, host of USA Up all night. I'll show you lots of fun movies. I'll show you lots of fun movies. Very appropriate. Where she would subject me to various horror movies that we would rent on pay-per-view. I distinctly remember that age renting one of the Puppet Master movies and Exorcist 3. Is inside with us! developmentally appropriate. My grandparents also uh, have the distinct privilege and great honor in my mind of introducing me to Full Frontal Nudity and Return of the Living Dead, one of the greatest films of all time and one of the universe's great, totally unnecessary <laughs> new dancing sequences. Let's get some light over here. Crash is taking off her clothes again. Hey, I did not mind. And the motorhome that they pulled up in, Cousin Eddie got nothing on this motorhome. Mm -mm, mm -mm. This is an abused mid 70s Winnebago, you know, with the big brown stripe and it had, it had the big flat front window and just like a slight bump out because the motor was up front, it wasn't a pusher. In fact, I distinctly remember the engine hump being between the passenger and driver's seat getting so hot, just unbelievably like carpet meltingly hot. Two inch thick shag orange carpet everywhere, no air conditioning. No air conditioning. And did I mention the dogs? Cause they're going with us on this trip. Three dogs whom my grandmother never trained, but was very good at shrieking at. Alice, what are you doing? It seemed normal at the time. You didn't know any better. <laughs> Where were my adults? <laughs> Where were they? <laughs> I had been to Disney World two times prior to that, but I had very vague memories of them. I was very young. I think I was, Four and five or five and six. I mean, I couldn't have been older than six the last time I had been. Maybe I was four and six, that might be true. I went once with my grandmother, my other grandmother, who's kind of the polar opposite of this grandmother in a lot of ways. And I have like vague fleeting memories of that trip. I remember trying to convince my other grandmother that I didn't need to be in a car seat because my parents never put me in a car seat. And she, not wanting to throw them under the bus, I think, said, well, in Florida, it's the law, so you're gonna have to go in a car seat when you're driving with me. See, people often look back and they say, oh, it was the 80s, everybody was like that. No, <laughs> no, not everybody, just your parents. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I was very excited to go despite what should have been obvious red flags. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I was more than happy to leave. I would have much rather been in the Grossmobile than at home. I just remember my grandparents explaining to me as we were leaving, like, you know, Greg, we like the scenic route. We like the scenic route. I have driven to Florida many times as an adult from New Jersey, and I'll tell you what you do. You get on I-95 and, and generally speaking, you drive south. You can't really go far wrong if you drive south. My grandparents, we went west. We went more or less southwest to west. And remember I was eight, so I don't have an exact route in mind, but I know what we saw and what we did. I know for certain that one of my first things that happened on that trip is we did Skyline Drive in Virginia. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. It's in Shenandoah Valley. If you ever go to that national park, I'm sure you'll do Skyline Drive. It's very scenic. It's the definition of a scenic route. Not directly en route to Florida, but that doesn't matter because we went to West Virginia next because West Virginia has a dog track. You see, my grandmother was an animal lover and her favorite way to love animals was to gamble on them. And from there we went to Kentucky because we had to visit Secretariat's grave. I know we wound up in St. Louis because I remember my grandfather explaining the St. Louis Arch to me and me thinking it was very cool. I'm pretty sure actually a lot of this road trip was about getting to St. Louis because my grandmother is from St. Louis and there was some sausage or something there that she wanted to buy that you couldn't buy anywhere else. She needed to get some sausage in St. Louis. Then I know we came more or less back east into Georgia because my grandparents had bought a small plot of like totally undevelopable land. Dahlonega? Man, it just came back to me. I think the town was called Dahlonega. And uh, cause my grandmother thought there was gold on that land. She thought there might be gold on that land. Uh, I don't think she knew much about mineral rights, but she was pretty sure that like, hey, up there in the mountains of Georgia, there might be some gold. She was always looking for gold. That was like a thing with her. She would, Joey, stop, that river might have gold in it. We'd have to stop. And I learned how to pan for gold. We did a lot of gold panning on this trip. That is not a joke. We did a lot of crabbing. And at the time I didn't question it because my grandparents loved crabbing. Weirdly, they loved crabbing. They loved it so much they loved the sport of it. They refused to use crab traps. We had to use, I swear to God, we had to use drop lines and a net because it was more sport. Picture the route we took, mostly inland. I'm pretty sure they had us crabbing in like swamps. Like I think it was just, there was nothing else to do. We would go crab in a swamp. Crabbing and painting for gold. We're looking for things that aren't there today. My grandfather had diabetes and he was very bad at managing it. And so while driving, he was regularly like nodding off because his blood sugar was a mess. And the RV would just weave all over the highway. It was a disaster. I'm sitting up in the passenger seat and I went to open my window. These things were like house windows. You know, you slid them forward or back. They were like kind of like sliding doors. And so I'm sliding it forward and my grandfather must have dozed off. And he suddenly jolts awake, probably screamed at by my grandmother, Jimmy! and he jerks the wheel. And I'm holding on to this little edge of the window and then pop! The window exploded, which just sent like a shower of 10,000 little cubes of broken glass all over me, which is safe, by the way. And that genuinely, like that's actually like the thing you want to do. I got a few like nicks and stuff, but like no serious cuts or anything like that. And so we took the scenic route, you see. We took the scenic route down to Florida and we finally got to Florida. Finally, we had to Disney World. I want to point out, it has been three weeks. I've been in this motorhome for three weeks. We park at the Ticket and Transportation Center. We're there in the motorhome in the TTC parking lot. It's Florida and it's summer. And even if you've never been to Disney World, I'm sure you can imagine that that's a thing that you have to prepare for. That's a thing that you have to dress for. You have to think a little bit about the heat. I mean, I'm sure I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops. I lived in flip-flops at that age. I now hate flip-flops. I don't like the thing between my, anyway. And my grandmother, she had ideas. She almost certainly was wearing a lavender leisure suit that she had sewed herself that was made out of polyester drapes. She had her hair done up. She was wearing heels. I'll never forget that. I don't, not tall heels, but you know, inch, two inches. Could not go out without heels. It was very important for her. She also always brought up the fact that she could buy shoes very cheap because she had size five shoes and that was the sample size and she could buy the sample shoes is very cheap. That just came back to me. And so she was wearing heels and all the jewelry she owned she had a lot of gold chains and not like thin ones, like thick ones. Like she had ropes of gold and stuff. She loved gold. She kind of looked like if you combined Dr. Ruth and Mr. T. It is entirely possible that she was wearing a fur shawl. She loved a fur shawl. She wore one almost all the time. Every chance she got, if she was dressing up, Florida or not, she probably had a fur shawl on. 
So we get on the ferry, we take the ferry over to the Magic Kingdom from the Ticket and Transportation Center. We go into the Magic Kingdom, we go under the train station. I emerge into this escapist. Remember, I'm the guy who looked at that motorhome and said, that's right, I don't wanna be here, I wanna be there. <laughs> I emerge into this wonderful ersatz Americana dream, this 1910 Marceline Main Street, USA. Oh my God, that, just stepping into that movie, you know, had such a powerful effect on me. Um, it's, I, I used to tell people that Main Street USA was my favorite attraction at Walt Disney World. My grandmother spotted a bench and she said, Joey, I gotta sit down, I'm too hot. Why didn't you tell me not to wear heels? So she sits down on the bench and we're standing around. And my grandfather says, hey, you know, if you wanna take a rest, why don't I take Greg on a couple of rides and we will come back and you'll be rested and we'll figure out what to do from there. Great idea, go! This is fantastic in my opinion. First thing we ride is Mission to Mars. From there we cross the park back to Pirates of the Caribbean. I remember distinctly, my grandfather was hot, you know? And he was just this kind of guy, he was like reaching out of the boat and splashing the water onto him and me. And I was like, Papa, you can't, you can't put your hand outside the ride vehicle, you can't scoop up the water like that. I can do whatever I want, which was a thing he said a lot. Ride Pirates of the Caribbean, we get out and right across the way there is the Enchanted Tiki Room. And we did the Enchanted Tiki Room. And that might be my earliest available memory of the Enchanted Tiki Room, which is gonna matter in a minute. Then my grandfather said, you know, we should probably check in on your grandmother. Sure, sounds like a good idea to me. I'm eight, I have no concept of time. All I know is that we just did three rides. That's like nothing. <laughs> it's been, what, five minutes? We get back to Main Street, USA, find my grandmother apoplectic. She is shrieking at the top of her lungs, out of her mind, red in the face, nuts. You abandoned me to die! Lost it completely every, the foulest, the language coming out of her mouth. Also, I forgot to mention this, she had had a couple of girly beers that morning. Girly beers, that's what she called a Coors Light. She would call those a girly beer. I think it's because in the 70s, there was like a thing with three and a half percent beer because it was like a tax loophole. She thought that light beer was a continuation of that three and a half percent thing and that that was girly beer. <laughs> so she drank a lot of girly beers and a lot of blackberry brandy. She was very angry, shrieking, losing her mind. We had tried to kill her. We had tried to abandon her in the heat in Florida. No one told her not to wear heels or a fur shawl. Enough is enough. What you've done to me is unforgivable. We're leaving. And we did. <laughs> I did three rides at the Magic Kingdom and they're dragging me, dragging me. You know, I'm sure tears must have been streaming down my face. I'm sure I was begging them to turn around. I was pleading with them. I'm sure I couldn't believe what was happening. I'm sure I must have said, well, obviously we're coming back tomorrow. This was just a taste. This was just a taste test, a little sample. I get it an appetizer. You can't sit down for the whole meal. You gotta have the jalapeno poppers or some some nachos or something, we'll get the meal tomorrow. We're not coming back tomorrow. We did not come back. We did not go back to the Magic Kingdom. We did not do anything else at Walt Disney World. In fact, I don't know what else we did on that trip. As limited as my memory is of the way down, my memory of the way home is a void. I think it was a very joyless drive back to New Jersey. And I think we went straight back to New Jersey. In fact, I would venture to say we did not take the scenic room home. I think that experience left a kind of Disney-shaped hole in my heart. And with a Tiki note, right? Like Tiki and Disney for me go together a lot because like the Tiki room, that was the last thing I did there. And then I was ripped away by my grandmother's gnarled hands and long fingernails, jewel encrusted hands. She wore so many rings. I didn't get to go back for another, at least a decade back to Disney World, but God, I wanted to so badly every day. Not a day went by that I did not wish fucking hell I was at Disney World. I had friends who would go back every year. That wasn't me. Uh, you know what I had? Back in the day, there used to be commercials on television, A, visit Disney World, and if you call this number, we'll send you a free Disney trip planning VHS. So I would call that number, it was free, I could get that, and they would send you this wonderful 45 minutes, sometimes longer, VHS of just the most beautiful, mouth-watering park 
cinematography, oh my God, S slight slow motion, just huge, beautiful golden hour, blown out backgrounds, this nice creamy bokeh with a shallow depth of field and these happy smiling people, they were all having so much fun, just turbo powered hyper nostalgia. Oh my God, I could have fallen in to those tapes. I watched them so much. That was my way to go to Disney World. And so I, I have this question, right? Like, am I a Disney adult? Because I know the internet, the world seems to hate Disney adults. The world seems to hate people who are grown-ups that spend their money on the things that they like. I don't get it, but I recognize that it's true. Am I amongst their ranks? Oh, I am. I am. Because now that I'm a grown-up, and I have a little bit of grown-up money, believe me, I wish I had a little bit more grown-up money, I get to go to Disney World whenever I want, or more accurately, whenever I can afford to. And I do. Dag nabbit. Whew. I told myself I wasn't going to finish this, and then I did. I love the stagecraft of it. I love walking into a dream. I love themed environments. I love tiki rooms. I love tiki bars. Before I ever had a tiki drink, I loved tiki rooms. I've wanted a tiki room. I wanted my parents to let me take my bedroom and turn it into a thatched hut with tiki things in it, and oh, they did not. That experience, that very formative, defining core memory, that character building experience, which is the term we use for the psychological damage that our parents and grandparents foist upon us when we are childs. I don't really have a button for all of this. I don't have like a really good like hard out like zinger to land on. I just, that's, I think that's why I love Disney World and Tiki things. And I think that's why those things go hand in hand for me. And as a result of that, I want to let you know that I think next week, I'm going to be reviewing all of the drinks at Trader Sam's Grog Grotto at Disney World. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, journey into my childhood. Believe me, there's a lot more to tell. <laughs>